this talk is not about whether or not you want to treat your patients who have prostate cancer uh, with testosterone. Uh, this talk is really about do we really believe testosterone is a risk for causing prostate cancer or somebody being diagnosed with prostate cancer. And, and listen, I, I'm not going to lie to you all. I'm turned 50 years old this year, and not a day goes by where I don't think to myself, should I be on testosterone? And, you know, I, I, I've had sports injuries, I don't have the energy I used to, I don't sleep as well. And the reason I don't put myself on testosterone is that I still worry about what are the long-term sequelae of this. Um, but I'm going to tell you the punchline of my talk just in case a big hook comes out and pulls me off the stage before I finish, which is that I do not believe that testosterone should be considered or testosterone therapy in hypogonadal or testosterone deficient men should be considered in any way, shape, or form a risk factor for prostate cancer. And I'm hoping that with the evidence I'm going to share with you, that you'll believe that too at the end. So again, my disclosures, they haven't changed. I do want to just point out that I've provided consultancy to a company called BioT, which is a publicly traded company that provides hormone replacement. Uh, but this will not in any way influence what I tell you today. And the work that I'm going to share with you is NIH-funded work, uh, the National Institute of Aging. So again, this is our guy. This is the man walking into my office. He's 66. Um, he's referred with ED and low libido and uh, decreased energy. Um, has anyone seen this man before? I have. Um, and what he says is, I just don't have the strength that I used to. Uh, he, your referring docs are good docs. They've checked his labs by guidelines, Endocrine Society, AUA guidelines, and they checked him twice. And I just want to say there's no tricks here. He is unequivocally has low testosterone, free in total. His gonadotropins are normal. His PSA is arguably normal. He's got a normal crit. So no tricks here. And the question is, would you treat him with testosterone? And if you did, um, would you counsel him about a potential risk of prostate cancer? either because you believe it or you think you have to medical legally. Um, there's a lot of hullabaloo about testosterone therapy that began in the late 2000s with an Institute of Medicine statement. This turned into an FDA statement. And for this purpose, I've distilled down the AUA's statement, which is that testosterone therapy is fine in appropriate individuals, our guy, um, as long as you really had a good discussion of the risks and benefits of testosterone therapy. And should prostate cancer come into those discussion of risks and benefits? Well, you know, thinking about our patient, it's really clear that there are some good things for him. And while this talk is not designed to point out the fact that we now have a series of really strong, randomized, controlled trials showing the clear benefits of testosterone replacement in men who are deficient, um, and I'm happy to refer you to that literature, there's also this potential risk. So we've got the good effects on the brain, the good effects on muscle, and I should have put bone strength in green here too, but there's this issue of the prostate, which we know is a hormonally sensitive organ. Who knows who this man is? Jesse? Charles, Charles Huggins. So Charles Huggins, uh, to the best of my knowledge, the only urologist to have received the Nobel Prize in medicine and physiology, hails from Nova Scotia, born at the turn of the century, did most of his amazing work at the University of Chicago. Um, he died in the city of Chicago. I'm confident that he, had he been born half a century later, he would have been invited to speak here. Um, but why, he, was, he received the Nobel Prize for showing that you could treat metastatic prostate cancer by depriving men of testosterone. Um, really, really important work. But out of that came this idea that surely if you take away testosterone and you put cancer into hibernation, well then, if you give testosterone, surely we must be fanning the flames, flipping a switch, doing something that is dangerous. And that's where we find ourselves as urologists. And, you know, this led to a cascade of studies. I wish we had a couple of hours for me to give you this talk. But in 20 minutes, what I can tell you is that early randomized control trials looking for benefits of testosterone found a signal for prostate cancer. They found signals for many other things, but there was a signal that maybe these guys were getting prostate cancer at an inordinate level. Now, 
Mind you, randomized controlled trials are trials of efficacy. They are looking at the efficacy of an intervention. They are not, they'll, they'll capture immediate adverse events, but I would ask any of you, if you give a man testosterone to, today and you detect prostate cancer, is that a prostate cancer that was caused by that testosterone? And it turns out that if you take a bunch of randomized controlled trials with that intent and you combine them into a meta-analysis, you know, you don't get trustworthy results about does testosterone really serve as a nidus for prostate cancer? What we do know, what we do know for sure is that men on testosterone get screened more for prostate cancer and we know that they get biopsied more. We know that from enumerate trials and from enumerate meta-analyses of these trials. And yet we're still uncomfortable saying, hey, testosterone doesn't cause prostate cancer. So in 2012, the NIH put out an RFA for uh, a different type of study, large pharmacoepidemiologic studies that would go to big data and say, if we mine big data, um, can we really find long-term adverse events amongst men treated with testosterone? Um, I was fortunate enough to receive one of these grants, and this is our study, which was based out of the Veterans Affairs Healthcare System that I affectionately called the T-Rex study. It's not really a trial, so it's not registered as such. But this is a, an enormous pharmacoepidemiologic study of men aged 40 to 89 that were in the system treated with testosterone and followed for prostate cancer for about a decade. Um, this is our hypothesis, this idea that, you know, if you treat somebody with exogenous testosterone, you could increase their risk of prostate cancer. Um, maybe we're flipping a switch. Maybe we're fanning the flames, but maybe, just maybe, we're just increasing their likelihood of diagnosis which I think we can all, as urologists or affiliated with urology, agree that that also is impactful. And certainly for this study, we were most concerned about those cancers which are really impactful, aggressive prostate cancer. We thought the VA system, for those of you who know it, was a really spectacular place to conduct such a study. It's a huge population, 8 million users a year. Uh, they have a ubiquitous EMR that spans the nation. Uh, they have prescription data that is readily available. Um, T treatment is common in the VA system, and they have their own cancer registry, and they link to Medicare. So if you're treated in the VA, you diagnose with cancer in the VA, we're going to find you. Um, our basic study design was a cohort study. Uh, as I said, these are men aged 40 to 89. They come into the cohort when they're detected to have low testosterone by, by guidelines. And then we had to show that they weren't adrift. They were actually regularly using the VA system so that we didn't have bias introduced. And like a trial, we had to exclude men who were clearly going to be at risk. Uh, those already diagnosed with prostate cancer, already had a biopsy, elevated PSA. But we also had to exclude men who just, you know, maybe their PCP wasn't screening them at all. Those wouldn't be good members of our study. So if you weren't getting any PSAs, we excluded you. Follow them. Once they enter, we follow them through time. And these, this is our primary outcome, incident aggressive prostate cancer by SEER or AJCC guidelines. Uh, obviously, we're also in, interested in any prostate cancer. We're interested in death and then the end of study. Um, a lot of s people smarter than me helped us to model this data. This isn't the kind of thing where we showed up and just extracted data, did some analyses. This was a five-year study. Even though we weren't primarily collecting data, it still took us five years to figure out how do we get it right. Um, and there are a few different ways that you model exposure to testosterone. You could say any amount of testosterone is impactful, but in a statistically more powerful model, we say that surely the more testosterone you get or the longer you get it, that is more impactful. So time varying cumulative dose. Look, there's so much bias that can come into a study like this. So we know that men on testosterone get screened with PSA more. That leads to more biopsies and unequivocally a higher rate of cancer. So how do we handle that? Well, we remediated this by creating a new variable out of the data called PSA screening intensity. So we equilibrated those who were and were not treated with testosterone by how intensely they were being followed with PSA. Uh, 
let's see. And, and then we really wanted to balance the, this cohort study on how sick were they. You know, what were their medical comorbidities? And so we adjust them as they enter the cohort. And then at intervals of six months, we rebalance the cohort, something called time varying uh, adjustment. So this is what we see. So this is about 150,000 men, so a huge group of men. Impressively, a third of these men were treated with testosterone. This is almost one and a half million prescriptions. And um, in a really pleasing way, what we learned was that they were treated with various forms of testosterone, with over 60% treated with intramuscular testosterone, the testosterone where we know that they're getting it biologically. Median follow-up three years, but up to 10 years. Um, and this is a very medically comorbid group, but very similar between men who were and were not treated. This is just for me to impress you with how much data we had. But you can just see the thousands and tens of thousands of medical conditions that we put into our modeling to balance these men. It's important for us to know that they were actually getting the T. So this is just for me to prove to you that all these men had low T when they came into our cohort. All of their T's went up, whether they got testosterone or not, but they clearly went up the most in the men who got intramuscular testosterone, something we know from other literature. All right, I would just wanna, I, this isn't gonna be death by tables, but I do wanna say, um, I, I've put a classic epidemiologic table up here because I want you to believe me, which is that this is a lot of person years of follow-up. So this is a lot of statistical power, but I'd like you to focus all your attention on the far right column, hazard ratio, which is our measure of relative risk. So this is just saying, uh, so remind, just to remind you, a relative risk of one means there's really no impact, either protective or risk. And a 95% confidence interval that crosses one means there's no statistical significance. And what I'd like you to appreciate about in this modeling where we are looking at aggressive and any prostate cancer, there appears to be no excess risk amongst men treated with testosterone. When we do our more powerful calculation, looking at time varying dose, we also see no increased risk and maybe even a slight protective effect for those men treated for the longest period of time. And if we have time, we can talk more about that later. Same story for any prostate cancer. Same story, no increased risk by time varying dose of testosterone. I told you that it was clear that men getting shots clearly had a biologic increase in their serum testosterones. So we thought, let's break our analysis out into topicals and non-topicals. Again, hazard ratios approaching one with no statistical significance. So no increased risk of prostate cancer, either aggressive by ever never, by varying time varying cumulative dose, and the same held true for any prostate cancer. So how do we interpret this? Well, what I can say based upon our study design, which I think is a well-designed, well-thought-out, and well-analyzed group of men, the use of testosterone does not appear to increase the risk of aggressive prostate cancer or any prostate cancer. It doesn't matter whether we look at it as a as a solitary exposure, ever, never, or we look at their time-varying clinical uh, cumulative dose, and it does not seem to matter whether we give them something that raises their T levels a little bit or a lot. So, to redux, back to our guy, 66-year-old, he clearly has testosterone deficiency by symptoms, his labs fit the bill. Would you treat him with testosterone, and importantly, would you feel the need to tell him that he may be at risk for prostate cancer? I hope the answer is no. Um, it takes an army. You know, I presented this in about 17 minutes, but uh, this was, it takes an army of people who are really smart to put together data like this. And so this is the team of folks who uh, helped this study move forward. Um, and certainly the NIH deserves a lot of acknowledgement for funding these studies. I know we don't have time, but I welcome anyone to email me who wants to talk about this.